Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hi there, it's Alan Cross, and I want to introduce you to another podcast that I think you'll like. It's called Canadian History X, and it takes you on a historical tour through communities across the country and brings you events from the past, everything from the Summit Series to the expulsion of the Acadians. Canadian history is definitely not boring, and host Craig Baird shows you that with his infectious love for our past. On the weekly podcast, he introduces you to people like Elijah Harper, one of the first Indigenous leaders to be elected to provincial government, and Henry Morgenthaler, who fought for abortion rights. Each episode brings you a unique story of villains, heroes, daredevils, and bootleggers that helped shape our history, as well as how world events impacted us. Like the time, say, four lads from Liverpool made their mark north of the 49th. This is the story of the Beatles in Canada. On a warm, cloudy day in mid-August 1964, the world's biggest band was flying from London to San Francisco for their first major North American tour. Before they could reach their destination, they needed to refuel. What would have likely just been a quick stop that no one would have noticed suddenly wasn't when a man by the name of Bob Burns at CJAY TV found out that this band was on its way. He went to the local radio station and announced that the hottest band in the world was about to land in Winnipeg. The band landed on August 18, 1964 at 2.05 p.m. Before long, the airport was full of fans. They swarmed behind a fence off the runway, hoping to catch a glimpse of the stars. One local high school student, a young man named Bryce Decker, took a chance. After arriving at the airport, he ran across the runway, up the stairs, and nearly got into the plane before he was grabbed by security. The entire escapade was captured in a wonderful series of photographs. According to Decker, he took the risk when he saw that the door to the plane was open and there was no one on the steps. He would later say, Just as they were wrestling with me, I caught a glimpse of the band through the door and they were all chuckling. I just did it for a bit of fun. I didn't realize there was anything attached to it. The young man was taken back to the crowd by the RCMP, but for a brief moment, Decker was a celebrity. He was recognized by other fans and they begged him to take a photo with them. Then, two girls saw him and pushed him into a corner. As tears streamed down their faces, they asked him, What did they look like? Did you see anything? Afterward, he went to a coffee shop where another girl recognized him, put down a dollar, and told the owner he could have anything he wanted to drink. The band had no plans to disembark, but after the incident with Decker, one of the members exited the plane and yelled, Hello Winnipeg! and came down the stairs as a throng of reporters swarmed around him, including Bob Burns, the man who let the cat out of the bag. John Lennon. May I speak to you for a moment? Bob Burns from Channel 7 Television. John, that's not my fault. I know. The sound quality is a little rough, but you can hear him quickly interview John Lennon. He would later state that Ringo Starr was the most gregarious of the band and seemed the most mature. Oh, and the man who greeted the crowd was none other than Paul McCartney. In less than half an hour, the Beatles were on their way, never to return to Winnipeg. But it wasn't the last Canadian saw of them. I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X. They are considered, and still are, the greatest musical group in history. And I'm sorry, but there's no debate about that. During the 1960s, they traveled the world and brought their music to millions. It seemed like these four long-haired boys from Liverpool came out of nowhere, yet they harmonized so beautifully they were irresistible. Not only was their music great, they were cheeky, and it seemed they didn't take anything all that seriously, and it made for a deadly combination. Between 1962 and 1966, the Beatles performed in over 1,400 concerts across the planet, with the vast majority being in the United Kingdom. Of those 1,400 or so concerts, seven were performed in Canada. For Canadians, that love affair with the Beatles it began with a bit of a rocky start. On February 18, 1963, the song Love Me Do first hit the airwaves, but it didn't exactly set the country on fire. Paul White, the executive for Capitol Records Canada, said the Beatles only sold 170 copies in total. Please Please Me would sell 280 records, and From Me To You sold 300. It seemed that Canada was not interested in the Beatles. But that all changed with the release of She Loves You in September 1963. Written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, 
The song quickly exploded in popularity, selling 100,000 copies, and due to a huge spike in demand, the earlier songs were reissued as the public now clamored for the Beatles. Although the United States gets a lot of attention because it's where the Beatles made their TV debut, it was in Canada where they were embraced first. Nearly a year before they broke through in the United States, songs such as All My Lovin', Roll Over Beethoven, and Twist and Shout were only available in Canada. In fact, Capitol Records Canada had to manufacture the records north of the 49 and ship them to the United States. At least 100,000 copies of each song, but some estimates put the exports as high as 350,000 copies each. But as Beatlemania spread, so did their popularity, and by the spring of 1964, the Beatles were not only big in their home country, but they had made it big in North America as well. In February, the group had played New York, Washington, and Miami, had appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, and they were attracting the same sort of buzz they had at home. And this led to the Beatles' 1964 North American tour, and of course, Canada's first meeting with the Fab Four on the tarmac in Winnipeg. But as I mentioned, Canadians wouldn't see the band again until the Beatles' first official stop and performance on August 22, 1964. And the concert was held at the Pacific National Exhibition in Vancouver, British Columbia. The p e is an annual 15-day summer fair and amusement park held in Vancouver, beginning in mid to late August and ending in September, usually around Labor Day. In the warm, late summer air, local radio host Red Robinson served as the master of ceremonies for the concert. But things didn't get off to a great start. The show was supposed to start at 8pm, but the pilot of the plane bringing the Beatles to Canada forgot to sign a document and the band was forced to return to the airport to finish the paperwork and then head back to the stadium. Meanwhile, 20,000 fans were going crazy waiting for the band to appear. And then at 9.23pm, the Beatles took the stage and opened with Twist and Shout. The song was a cover based on the Isley Brothers version. The Beatles' rendition of Twist and Shout was released on their first UK album, Please Please Me, and John Lennon provided the lead vocals. Their version of Twist and Shout has been called the most famous single take in rock history. As you can imagine, the song threw the crowd into a tizzy. Halfway through the show, the crowd was near rioting. Robinson was told to go on stage and tell the crowd to calm down or else the Beatles would have to leave. So he walked on stage and told the crowd to back up because there were fears of people being injured. Unfortunately, it seems that no one told John Lennon this was going to happen. So he told Robinson, get off our stage, nobody interrupts the Beatles. To which Robinson responded, John, Brian Epstein set me up here. John looked down at Brian Epstein, the band's manager, who gave him the okay. John turned to Robinson and said, okay, carry on mate. Robinson went out, he quieted the crowd as best he could, but enough that the band could carry on safely. The fans screaming could be heard in the live broadcast of the concert on CKNW as the band played 11 songs, which oddly didn't include I Wanna Hold Your Hand, one of their biggest songs at the time. Then, just 27 minutes after they arrived on stage, they left. The show was over, the band jumped into an awaiting limousine and were driven to the Vancouver International Airport. They then flew straight to Los Angeles. This was the band's one and only show in Western Canada. It would be a few weeks before the Beatles touched down in Canada once again. On September 6, 1964, more than 10,000 young people stormed Toronto's International Airport to get their first glimpse of the Fab Four. Behind a 60-meter chain-link fence, the frenzied crowd jostled for position and belted out verses from chart-crushing tracks such as Please Please Me, Love Me Do, and She Loves You. But mostly, they just screamed in a way the city had never heard before. Meanwhile, inside the terminal, the band signed autographs for immigration officials before being driven to the King Edward Hotel in downtown Toronto. Fans were already gathering at the hotel, and they were in a frenzy as the band stepped out of the car. Paul would have his shirt torn open by a fan, Ringo was separated from John and George, but thankfully, police were able to quickly restore order on the street and get the band into the hotel. But Beatlemania wouldn't be conquered so easily. Upon the band's arrival at the hotel's royal suite, they found a 14-year-old girl hiding in the linen closet. Then, as the band flopped on couches, chain-smoked, and asked for J&B scotch, then Toronto Mayor Phil Givens, along with his wife, called on them. At 1.30pm, they were turned away by a blonde woman. 
They were told that two of the Beatles were sleeping and two others were with relatives. The next day, the Daily Star released an article with the headline, Beatles Blonde Snubs Mayor. The mayor wasn't the only one turned away. Teens kept getting past security. It was as if the hotel was dealing with an infestation for which they had no repellent. An article in the Toronto Star says that at 3 a.m., Larry Kane, a radio journalist based in Miami, who was traveling with the band, heard a knock on his hotel room door. When he answered, he found a teen, wearing a housekeeping uniform that was about four sizes too big. Are you the man who called for soap, she asked. It's three in the morning, he replied. I don't need any soap. An awkward pause followed before the girl asked, Do you know the Beatles? Can you take me to them? By 8 a.m., the mob returned to the hotel and police reinforcements had been called in. The band's first visit to Toronto required more than 850 officers from the city, the Ontario Provincial Police, and the Mounties. The crowd was unconcerned by the small army as fans jostled and fought for position around the hotel that morning. They chanted, We want the Beatles, and sang a modified version of the national anthem. Whenever a hallucinating fan pointed and shouted, There they are, stampedes would break out, keeping the first aid station inside the hotel very busy as they treated fainters. In total, they looked after 55 fans that day. And this was hours before the first of two Beatles concerts at Maple Leaf Gardens. By 10 a.m., the scene outside the gardens mirrored that of the hotel, and now ticket holders entered the fray. By noon, 4,000 police officers and Mounties were on duty around the gardens, and they were forced to divide the crowd into smaller sections. Majestic horses trotting sideways, head to tail, pushing back waves of deranged youth on the streets of Toronto. At 2.30 p.m., the doors opened at the gardens. The concert was scheduled to start at 4 p.m., with the Beatles not expected to hit the stage until about 5.30 p.m. Back at the hotel, there was a new plan in the works to get the Fab Four to the venue unscathed. Limos were to pull up at the King Edward Hotel, as expected. As fans pounded at the vehicles like zombies, the band would dug out the back door and into a paddy wagon that would smuggle them into the gardens. A five-block area was sectioned off around the venue 12 hours before the arrival of the group, and downtown Toronto became Beetle Land. As the vehicle carrying the Beatles approached the gardens, fans began to lose their minds. The driver was forced to navigate this obstacle course as officers cleared a path. Eventually, it drove quickly into the loading bay with about 50 officers in tow. The Beatles had arrived at the venue, but that only made the situation on the street crazier. It was a hot, muggy, late summer day with temperatures at around 30 degrees Celsius. Inside the venue, it was even hotter, and soda and ice cream vendors were running out. The water fountains were barely functioning, but dehydration and exhaustion were no match for the fervor of the fans. As the opening bands, which included Bill Black's Combo, The Exciters, Clarence Frogman Henry, and the sultry Jackie DeShannon hit the stage, the crowd booed. They only wanted one band, and one band only. Then, just after 5.30pm, Jungle J. Nelson, a local radio personality, appeared on stage in front of the record-breaking crowd to say, The Beatles. One Globe and Mail reporter said that the crowd was impossible to hear because four Beatles can't out-vocalize a Maple Leaf Gardens full of youngsters baying out their adulation. Rumor has it that police officers stationed inside jammed empty shell casings in their ears and that vendors ran for cover. And as the band appeared on stage, flashbulbs went off, blinding everyone in sight. It's unclear if they could even hear their own voices over the roar of 16,761 screaming voices, nor do we know if they could see anything as bras, lipsticks, and other items rained down on them. Beatlemania hit the gardens hard, and with that came collapsing fans. In total, 109 fainted at the venue. This wasn't a rock show. This was mass hysteria. When the first concert ended around 6 p.m., the Beatles were shuffled to a dressing room where the band took photographs with local DJs, fan club presidents, and Miss Canada. They then had a press conference where they looked a little bewildered, but as usual, they were charming to admirers and unleashed their savage wit on journalists. Once done, they waited at the gardens for their second show. If you've seen footage from a Beatles concert, you can imagine that the second concert was identical to the first. Screaming fans, blinding flashbulbs, lipsticks, bras, frenzy and fainting. 
At 10 p.m., they would begin their second performance, and when they got off stage, they were shuffled back into the police vehicle for their return to the hotel. By now, fans were circling the hotel, and no ruse would trick them. The next day, just before noon, the Beatles headed back to the airport. The sun was shining, and the crowd was considerably smaller. The mood was also different. This was the end. They signed autographs, posed for photos, waved to admirers, and then boarded their plane and left. Next stop, Montreal. This would be the Beatles' only visit to La Belle Province. Their arrival at the Dorval Airport mirrored what happened at every stop on their tour. Hordes of screaming fans at the airport, throngs of fans lined the streets clutching magazines and singing their favorite Beatles songs. But the band's only time in Quebec was marred by death threats from French-Canadian separatists. This was the time of the FLQ, after all. Police sharpshooters had to be present in Montreal Forum on St. Catherine Street, where the two concerts took place. And aside from the usual deafening sound and fainting, the concerts went off without incident. But the threat was memorable enough for the Beatles. In 1990, George Harrison said, A Montreal newspaper reported that somebody was going to kill Ringo because they didn't like his nose or something, because he was probably the most British of the Beatles. I don't know. Of the incident, Ringo said, Some people decided to make an example of me as an English Jew. The one major fault is I'm not Jewish. Threats we took in stride. I mean, suddenly there'd be a few more cops, but this was one of the few times I was really worried. 9,500 fans waited in anticipation inside the forum, and at 5.20 p.m., the Beatles took the stage for their first concert to perform a 12-song set. Then they played their second show at 8.30 p.m. in front of 11,500 screaming fans, and then chose not to stay in Montreal and instead fly to Jacksonville, Florida. The band stayed in Montreal for only eight hours. Just as quickly as they arrived, they were gone, and Canadians would have to wait almost a year before getting another taste of Beatlemania. On August 17, 1965, the Beatles returned to Canada. The group flew in from New York, and once again fans were there waiting for them to arrive at Pearson Airport, or what was at least Toronto International Airport at the time. They rushed the band as they arrived, only to be repelled by Toronto police officers who linked arms and attempted to contain the screaming fans. They arrived in the morning and stayed once again at the King Edward Hotel. Smart fans booked dozens of rooms in the hotel in the hopes of meeting the group. Each of the shows was also seen by 18,000 people, with the band playing their usual 12-song set, lasting for 27 minutes in all. Unlike the previous year when the band made front-page news in Toronto, this year they were on the inside pages with many starting to say that Beatlemania was fading and the band would soon disappear. And they weren't entirely wrong. Just a year later, in 1966, the band returned for their last two concerts ever on Canadian soil. The tour was also the last the band would ever play. Just eight shows and 12 days after they played Toronto, the band would stop touring forever and turn their focus on making music in the studio. But on that warm August day in 1966, 15,000 fans were there screaming for their idols. That number only went up to 17,000 fans for their second concert at 8 p.m., Jungle J. Nelson once again served as the MC for both shows, and, as it had become routine, fans fainted, and the day saw 50 audience members be treated for shock. After their concert, the Beatles stayed in Toronto for the night before flying out to Boston on August 18th. This time, they left forever. And while the band would never tour again, they redefined popular music and remained just as relevant today as they were 50 years ago. And while the group would never play Canada again, the country would still see individual members over the next few years. John Lennon, George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and Ringo Starr all played solo shows, but arguably the most famous solo Beatles story in Canada comes from John Lennon. As the Vietnam War raged on, John Lennon and his partner Yoko Ono held a week-long non-violent protest against the war, intended as a new way to promote peace. On May 26 to June 1, 1969, he held a bed-in for peace protest in Montreal. The first one was held in Amsterdam at the Hilton Hotel from March 25 to 31st, and the second bed-in was going to take place in New York, but due to a 1968 cannabis conviction, Lenin was not allowed in the United States. They then intended to host the event in the Bahamas, but after flying in on May 24, 1969, they only spent one night there because of the heat. That's when they decided to hold a demonstration in Canada. 
The couple landed in Toronto and stayed at the King Edward Hotel after being granted a 10-day visitor visa. The choice was between Montreal and Toronto, and ultimately they chose Montreal because it was closer to New York, which would make American press coverage much easier. John and Yoko flew to Montreal on May 26 and stayed in the room 1738, 1740, 1742, and 1744 at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel. Andre Perry, who owned a recording studio in the city, set up a simple setup of four microphones and a four-track recorder, and on June 1, 1969, in room 1742, the anthem, Give Peace a Chance, was recorded. During the week in Montreal, the couple was visited by Timothy Leary, Tommy Smothers, Dick Gregory, Murray the K, Al Cap, Allen Ginsberg, and of course, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Years later, in 1991, the hotel received permission from Yoko Ono to begin renting room 1742 in Lennon's name. A recent renovation turned all four rooms the couple stayed in into one large suite with two bedrooms, a dining room, two lounges, two bathrooms, and a pantry. The suite also includes virtual reality goggles so you can experience the view from the bed through the perspective of John Lennon. Today, room 1742 is called the John Lennon and Yoko Ono Suite. That's the end of the story of the Beatles in Canada, but there's one more fun fact about their time north of the 49. In attendance at the final Beatles stop in Toronto in 1966 was a 12-year-old boy. He said, the volume of the screaming was such that you could barely hear the music. That young man was John Tory. On October 27, 2014, Tory was elected Mayor of Toronto. Then, four years later, he was re-elected in 2018. But he wasn't the only fan to have a brush with fame. Remember Bryce Decker? The fan who took a chance and almost made it into the Beatles plane in Winnipeg? Well, his proximity to musical greatness didn't stop there. He went on to briefly play in a band called The Deverons, with music legend Burton Cummings, followed by a second, brief moment on rhythm guitar with the legendary band The Guess Who. Thank you for joining me on Canadian History X. Information for this episode comes from Read, 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 CBC, Winnipeg Free Press, Global News, Wikipedia, Manitoba Music Museum, The Toronto Star, The Beatles Bible, Montreal Gazette, and Toronto Plaques. The show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of producer Dila Velasquez. Audio design and production by Rob Johnston. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. And there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. If you enjoy this podcast, then please check out my other podcasts, From John to Justin, Canada, A Yearly Journey, Pucks and Cups, and Canada's Great War. We love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com, or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X. Canadian History X.